Amen, amen. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to this time of worship. I'd like to welcome everyone and especially any visitors we have with us. It's good to have you with us. If you haven't already, please find the red attendance folder on your pew and sign that and pass it along. We'd certainly appreciate it. Um, Just a couple of announcements. The beautiful floral spray up here this morning is given in love and memory of daughter and sister Debbie Ald, whose memorial service was here in the sanctuary on Friday. And uh, we're asking you to please join us uh, immediately after worship this morning for our Potluck Fellowship Dinner, where we'll celebrate our church's 70th birthday as well as our individual birthdays, as well as have a PHCC history quiz bowl. So get your thinking caps on. Um, I don't know if there's prizes, but it's always good to be right, right? Anyway, there are other announcements in the bulletin along with the calendar of activities for the week. So look at those as you're able. But for now, let's continue with worship. If anyone knows how to clone, I could, uh, I could use another copy of myself if we can make that happen. Okay, Where, what, uh, what are we doing now? It's one of the hymns. Hymn number one, which is the, 42, hymn, of praise. the hymn of praise, is going to be number 42. We're going to sing all three verses of I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Please stand as we sing. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth He formed the creatures with his word, and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky, there's not a plan glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne while all the sorrows fly from thee is ever in thy care and everywhere Please be seated. The scripture reading this morning is from Acts 12, 1 through 11a. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother and John, put to death by sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter, too. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him to trial after the Passover. 
So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side to wake him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell from Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening because he thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel. Here ends the reading of this holy word. Let's please bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit to this house, your house. Thank you for the opportunity for all of us to be together, to worship you, your miracles, the blessed gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. As our minds are stilled and our hearts are open, we welcome you in our lives and in our hearts in worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of devotion this morning is number 229. We'll sing verses 1 and 5 of All Praise to Thee. Psalm 96 says this, Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offering and come into his courts. May we all worship the Lord now through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Lord, help us to use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May our faithful use of these resources bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. We ask this in his holy name. Amen.
Coming to the Lord's Supper, the act of sharing communion together. <clears throat> if we go back in 1 Corinthians to the 11th chapter, there's a nugget there that we just read right over. So before we get to the passage that really talks about what we traditionally call the institution of the Lord's Supper, it says this. It says, when you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Right there, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. When you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, what in the world's it for then? It's so that you can respond to an invitation of Jesus. This is so you can respond to an invitation of Jesus. And it says something else in this passage too. It's for anybody that's hungry. Have you ever gotten to the invitation? I mean, ever, ever got to the conversation before about who should be allowed to come to the Lord's Supper and who should be allowed to come to the table? Well, that's just the people who've already expressed, put their faith in Jesus. It's only people who've been baptized. It's only people who've done that. It's not what it says. Let me give you the revised standard version of Joe. This right here, this table belongs to Jesus. We come together not to share the Lord's Supper, but we come because of his invitation. And anybody that's hungry from Jesus, for Jesus is invited. Anyone who's hungry for Jesus, anyone who wants to respond to his supper invitation, anyone is welcome at this table. Our hymn of preparation is number 367. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of As We Gather Around This Table. Father in heaven, I come to you in prayer this morning, thanking you for blessing us with your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came and gave his life so we might have our sins forgiven. Lord, help us all to try and show that same love to all we come in contact with. This I ask in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples and as they ate, he took bread and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body given for you, take eat and remember me. After they had eaten, he took the cup and again he gave thanks and he said, this cup is my blood poured for the remission of sin, do this and remember me. And so it is that we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup until he comes again. we come to our time of prayer to my knowledge we have no one in the hospital at this time which is a blessing though there are many in need uh, of our prayers those battling allergies respiratory infections flu yada 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 and also uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't remember in prayer those that have been affected recently by all the storms that have gone through so remembering those remembering the ones on our own hearts and minds that we'd like to give to God and Of course, those on our prayer list, let's now turn to him in prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, you created everything, and yet you're here with us now in this very room. May this time of worship draw us into a deeper relationship with you and with each other. Renew our faith, revive our joy, and restore our community to living according to the ways of Jesus. We come before you this morning asking for forgiveness for the times we've failed, when we've spoken unkindly, and when we've forgotten to embody the gospel of our Savior. Lord, we trust that you care about our joys and our sorrows. We know that you rejoice with us in times of celebration, and that you weep with us in times of suffering. We pray especially for the sick, the hungry, the lonely, and the fearful. We pray for those who are struggling in any way, knowing that you dwell within each of us as your beloved children. Give comfort, healing, guidance, and hope to all in need. Father, we love you. Give us the strength to follow you and the courage to share your transforming love with all people. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name, praying together the prayer he taught when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Grace Davis on the oboe. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> All state first band, first chair oboe player, by the way. <laughs> Grace, we'll see you Christmas Eve, if not before, right? <laughs> I have to get that in. Sure, we want to make sure we're on your list every year now. <laughs> Thank you, choir. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it so much. I got it. I'll get it here in a second. Yeah. When it comes to your faith as an individual or as a believer, I have a question for you this morning. As an individual believer, <clears throat> what do you know? What do you know that you know? that you know. And as a single person of faith, as a single believer, do you believe that you can make a difference? I think it's a pretty good question. I think sometimes we struggle with that, or we've heard of somebody that struggled with it, or maybe we've helped somebody that's been thinking through the question, how in the world can I, as just one person, the fact, how in the world can just one make a difference? I love to quote smart people. It's not hard to find smart people to quote because that just means most of the world compared to me. So I get to quote D.L. Moody this morning who once said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And that which I can do by the grace of God, I will do. Imagine what we could accomplish for Christ if we were all doing our part, and here's how it goes, for someone else. We are the body of Christ, one no more important than the other, but all stronger together. And as the body of Christ, together, think of the difference we make. In our scripture passage today that Billy shared earlier, Peter is rescued or led from prison in no small part due to the body of Christ, all the individuals getting together, believing, acting and praying. They all came together as a unified body, as a unified voice, as a family of God, and look out. God listened. God was moved. Because here's what I want to remind you of this morning before I invite Daryl to come up and join me. Here's what I want to remind you of this morning. As the body of Christ is the unified body of believers in Jesus Christ, you are a royal family. You belong to the king. We don't wear crowns or jewels that set us apart, but we're already set apart with God's grace and mercy. And because His love that is in us, 
We are able to show it and share it with others. And one of the ways that we do that is in prayer. In our scripture lesson this morning, Peter is in jail, and the church prays for Peter, and listen again to what it says. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Do you know that every time you get together, whether it's here all together, or as we pray for people, have prayer concerns, as we take those people, those prayer concerns, no matter where you pray for people, royalty is praying for people. For you are a royal family. Peter was going to trial the next day. What was going to happen? But the church came together and they they prayed. God heard. God hears. God has moved. God answers. A seminary buddy of mine once wrote something really profound and I want to share it with you. And he said, Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. And the church believed and was obedient and prayed for Peter. And God heard. So that brings us to a conversation with one of our own this morning. And I'm going to invite Daryl. Daryl, would you come up? And John, will you help Daryl? And I'm going to move over here for a minute. We're going to transition. It doesn't matter which chair I hold. John likes to put him in. He put him in the other one anyway. (laughs) He's part of a royal family. He can sit wherever he wants to, right? Don, can you give me a little more volume on this microphone? My voice is a little stronger than Daryl's. This morning, I'm going to hand the microphone to Daryl, and I'm going to do it with a set-up question, and it's this. Daryl, why did you feel like you wanted to share with people today? Over on here. Because I'm an old man in declining health, and I had to meet my spiritual part due to some ailments this fall or this winter. And I had to bring the two together to try to consolidate them in one body. And it was a spiritual doing that or the flesh part of the time. So I wanted to share the story because I think each one of you may have the same trouble out there sometime in your life. So just share your story with us. I'm not going to walk you through it. You've already done it once today. So just share with us. He said, even though 
You're hurting if you will press that button. It will ease the pain. Well, if you're hurting bad enough, you'll press that button now a little bit. I know I tell you. So I was no exception. And I'm laying there. Then I'm going to make a statement that you might have a little trouble understanding. This may have this turned out to be the best day of my whole life. And why would I say laying up in that shape? We're going to have to go back a little bit in time to understand that. About five years back in time. My health had already deteriorated then, but I was fortunate enough to have two new ailments come upon me. Both of them were stomach problems. One of them was an infected, or I probably have a good word, inferiority artery in my stomach which made me start losing the ability for to process my food like it should. So I started in on a weight loss at this time. The second one was, <clears throat> was a bowel obstruction, which hits you all of a sudden, you don't know it's coming. And that placed me in the hospital for the first time. Barbara had to get up and take me in in the middle of the night. Well, I was very fortunate. Medication the first time. There was treatment and it worked very well. At that time, I had a pastor by the name of Miles Cook that was here. And Miles come up to see me along the second or third day. I can't remember where. And I was sitting up in the bed with a group of people around me and I was entertaining. I was ready to run in my mouth. Miles said, I thought he was sick, Barbara. What's wrong with him? She said, they introduced him to Marvin. <laughs> well, she didn't let the remarks go there. She said, during World War II, they was a slogan out, loose slip, sink ship. She said, I hope they don't give him another dose. He's going to get the whole American fleet sucked in <laughs> Well, as that time went on, we'll skip forward about two or two and a half years. The second, my obstruction hit me without any warning like the first one. And it too went good. The medical profession, medicine worked fine. It didn't look like there's going to be any surgery. However, this time I got a shock. My surgeon come in, and I never will forget, he was drinking a Coke red can. He set it down and took his surgical cap off. He said, I'm moving around, but I want to talk to you personally. And I said, all right. He said, it has been my experience. Once you start having bowel obstruction, they will not quit. They will continue until I probably will have to do surgery on you. He said, at this time, when it comes up, I'm going to give you 24 hours. I want you to get all your family in because you're going to need to visit with them. Because he said, I don't think you're ever going to get off my table. I have to say it left me somewhat shocked that a medical professional would tell you that. Well, even the rest of that time, it didn't go as well. They called in the cardiologist, and I got blood on my lungs and around my heart. I was supposed to go home. Barbara come up my feet, it turned purple. They wouldn't release me, but I had to stay several more days this time in the hospital. I finally got out and made it home. But then another event took place in this church and in my life. We got a new pastor. The name of Joe Hodges. Joe came in and I think it very well maybe irritated me what went on. Everybody in North Little Rock had 
seen in that Joe Hodges except me. When I come to church, he wasn't here. And when he come to church, I wasn't here. It went over and I was in the food pantry right there trying to help out. And we had a lunch and they had a business meeting. But Joe come in and of course they made statements as our pastor and wanted to know if he wanted to make any statements. He said, I'm going to just get back here and observe right now. Such that and probably the most bizarre thing that may have happened to me up to that time at least was he sat there and he started analyzing people and I could understand what he was thinking and what he said. Folks, I spent two years after I retired at the Little Rock Mental Center and I'd sit in on some meetings about people that was hearing things and think they could really be people of mine. So it upset me. As soon as that meeting was over, I headed to the prayer chapel. Because I'm a coward, the only time I know when I get scared, I go to God and ask for some help. Well, I prayed and everything seemed all right. About that time, Joe Hodges walked by the prayer chapel. He come into this sanctuary and he began to play the piano. And he sang a song. And since that's the first day I seen him, that's the first day I knew. So I said, huh, we have a pastor with some musical talent, it looks to me like. I don't know for sure to this day, but I thought I heard. Okay. And I thought, boy, okay. Again, back, and I decided to praise him again. Well, that was all right. Everything seemed to be all right. So I got up to leave. Now, this wasn't verbal voice. This was just something like in my mind. It said, you're going to go in and tell him that he has been sanctioned to be the pastor of this church. And I said, hey, I'm not even on the pulpit committee. I've got an officer of this church. I've had nothing to do, couldn't even see the man for a month after he got here. And I'm supposed to go in and tell him that he is sanctioned to come to this church. Well, folks, I'm just like a lot of Christians. I'm a coward and I run home. And I'm sitting back in the bedroom in the chair that I have there. Barbara come in and said, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing. I really didn't want to talk about this because things like that still scare me when I don't know what's going on. Well, nevertheless, as time went by and more things developed, I had to approach Joe and tell him, I said, Joe, I'm a born boy, do you know what life I is? First time Joe showed me a little irritation, he said, Yes, I've been on a farm. I know what laid back is. I said, Well, I'm a laid back Christian, so don't try to get any no jobs. <laughs> well, that went on for a while, but you know, I took it up on myself to stand out there in the foyer and kind of harass Joe when he come out in the sermon to say something cute to him. You might have heard some of the remarks. Well, it's funny how God can bring things back like that to haunt you sometimes. <laughs> See, the third time that I had an obstruction, we went over, and again, the medication worked fine. I didn't have to have surgery. But this time, they pulled me up and they gave me a diet that's impossible to stay on. It consisted of bread, meat, and potatoes, and insure, and the bottles for, for the hour. And if Barbara was to fix anything else, they wanted to be in a blender and be in a liquid form. Well, you can't live that way. I only knew it was a matter of time before I would be back in the hospital. So I come back down to the prayer chapel and I lay 
went in and the awareness they asked. I said, God, I want a favor. I've come down to request this. I don't know who you'll grant it to me or not. But I said, I want to stand up on my own feet, visit my church the rest of this year, and have the holidays and enjoy my family. And I would not ask for anything else. If you let that come to pass, I will not ask you for anything else. Well, we went through the rest of the year. I had beautiful holidays with my family. We went out to BJ's farm market for New Year's. We ate our black eyed peas and some hog jowl out there so I could have good luck. <laughs> the second day of January, I called Barbara down there and I said, boy, Barbara, the time's come. You're having to take me to the hospital. Well, Barbara, you knew how apprehensive that had been and how upset I'd been about maybe not living very long, so it upset her quite a bit. But she took me and being a good wife, we went through. But this time I wasn't so lucky. They told me that the medication was not working this time. That things did not look good. On the Friday they come in and said, we will give you the Monday. Then we're going to have to set up surgery. If you don't show some real improvement over the weekend, the surgeon wasn't going to be there. Well, I'm going to bury this story a little bit here. In this church, and I've been here for many years, and in the past and up to now, we have prayer warriors in this church. They will go to battle when people are really against the wall where they need to be. I never seen stuff scattered so fast in my life. That was people got to calling me on the phone. I know Barbara had been part of it, but she knows everybody. <laughs> I never seen a lot of people all of a sudden told me they were praying for me. I guess Barbara let them know that I pretty much was in deep trouble. Well, on Sunday, my folks all gathered in the hospital room. I had a number of friends, more friends than I'd ever had in the hospital room. So many that they had to open up a waiting room and send part of them down there. I don't know where you've ever had a feeling or not, where people come in and look at you and you lay that bed and say, how do you feel? And you know they're not going to take you on. They're going to take Barbara or one of the kids off. And they're going to find out how you really feel or how you really do. Well, I've seen that. I mean, I know what's going on. And I thought, this is kind of like having a wake and I'm not dead. I mean, they're all gathered around me, you know. Come Monday morning, sure enough, we had to do the surgery. But on Monday afternoon, the surgeon come in and he said, I need to meet with you and Barbara. He said, there's an experimental thing that is not well known, but it's a treatment that possibly keep you from having surgery. He said, it will not hurt you if it don't work. So naturally, Barbara and I decided that we would have the treatment. The next morning they took me down and for the extra day of your x-ray and they laid me out and they put like six vials of stuff, I don't know what it was in it, and it was 12 treatments. You lay out or you take the picture. In the middle of this, Joe Hodges come in and Joe got down on his knees and looked me in the eye. And let me tell you something, the man can pray when your back's up against the wall. <laughs> something that I've always appreciated that you have done. He also gave me a report that I had all kinds of family and friends out there. Well, I thought nothing else could possibly change or go wrong. The next morning, we had a 
emergency surgery for my son-in-law. He was getting operated on with the same surgeon an hour and a half before that. And now the family's got two of us up there. We started down the hallway and the charge nurse come running out and hollered, take him back to the room. The surgeon wants a family meeting. When we get it, and they had to come from the surgical waiting room and back up. A whole bunch of people was lined up around the room to see what the world was going on. He said, there's a small blimp. There's some hopes. I know how you don't want to do surgery. I can give you 12 to 18 hours, then we'll have to do emergency surgery, but don't come to pass. I pulled the kids and asked Barbara, and they said, you're a sound mind. Make up your own decision. I told Barbara, I said, Barbara, I'm sick and tired. I have bought this, so I didn't get out. I said, every time I look at a plastic fork, I think it's going to kill me because I had to do these diets so much. I said, if it's all right with you, I will go have the surgery. And she said, I'll leave it up to you. Well, up and down the hall we went. My family prayed it too when they got me ready and everything. She said, you know, their goodbyes to after the surgery. You know, there's one thing that I left out of the first service, Joe. When anesthesiologists pushed that needle and darkness started to come over me, I wondered if it'd be the last bit of light my eyes would ever see on the surface. You can't help but think that. And that's why when I get over here and tell you the light, come back to my eyes and she was telling me to breathe. I got my answer. I didn't get more light back in my eyes. I was soon about to find out the why. The young man that I talked about, he put my fellows and he told me, he said, you need to rest, you need an hour before your folks get in here. I laid back and the first voice I heard was, you told your pastor that you was a laid back Christian. You'll be laid by when I tell you, you are laid by. I popped my eyes up to begin to look around to see who was messing with me. Because I never heard a verbal voice before. I never heard a voice like this before. Then I realized something going on, so I shut my eyes and it says, My people have prayed for you all over. And so many prayers come up to heaven that they brought me back down with them. And I'm going to raise you up. You're 87 years old and very weak. But I'm going to raise you up. And I'm going to stand you on your own two feet. But you are going to tell a story about me and my people. Said I'm sick and tired of people saying that you can't bring God's spirit down and that you can't have miracles, and you're going to tell people about that. So I understood then why that I got to see the light the second time. It wasn't because of anything I'd done. It was really because of what y'all done. You had bowed your back your neck and got on your knees, and you had prayed to God in a beard and change the course of men one time again. I'm going to go back to our text. I'm going to take you back 2,000 years ago. I'm going to take you to a dark street in Jerusalem. And I'm going to show you the human side of these people because I didn't get in that. You see, they were scared because it's a very authoritarian government and you better be scared of them. So the 
people, God's people, and they got down and they began to pray for Peter, the apostles. And God sent an angel and he stroked Peter on the side and told him to get up, get dressed, and the chains fell off of him. And he walked in by the guards and the gate swung open. When Peter come to in the middle of the street, he was just like us. He was scared and confused. And he didn't even know more and more what happened as we do when God does something. Because, see, Peter was totally human. Peter was just like any of us. He wanted to get to safety, so he had his house, and he knew to have God's people in it. And when he knocked on the door, the young lady asked who it was. And he told her it was Peter, and she ran to the elders in the house and told her Peter was at the door, and they said, it can't be Peter. He's down there in jails and shackles. It's impossible. You see, they're human. Much like we are today. Much like God's trying to enlighten us that we're no different than it was 2,000 years ago. When we get on our knees, we can bring God down. And He will interfere with the prayers of man. And one of the things He wanted to do is tell each one of you out there that you belong to this family that was talked about. You belong and you have the right to partition the most powerful human being, the most powerful being in the human race or in the universe. And sometimes we don't realize that we get lost on it as a human. But he asked me to let each one of you know that you are special and you need to know who you are. I want to ask Joe now to come in and help me close this. I want to thank you for taking time to listen to my story. I understand that it may have been a little too long. And I understand my friend Jack's so like I am. He's taking a nap. But <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, when I was giving you, I'd be right back there. <laughs> now I'm going to turn this over to Joe and let him finish it. And again, thank you for listening. in scripture of who we are and we might have a reminder from what amongst us of who we are and to whom we belong. Thank you for your power that moves. Thank you for your hand that moves. So then Peter came to himself and said, and oh God, may we come to ourselves and be reminded. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel. Oh God, we might be one you're sending 
to tell and remind somebody else, prayer matters. Be with us, O oh God, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment this morning is number 129. Please stand as we sing together verses 1, 2, and 3 of Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear Things I would ask him to tell me if he were here Scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea Stories of Jesus tell Let me hear how the children stood round his knee, and I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace, all in the love light of Jesus' face. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. 